Hello, University Presbyterian Church is a PCA church located in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Please join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or live stream as we worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good morning again, UPC. Good to be with you all today, especially those who are visiting with us. Thank you. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. If you take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 45 this morning, today we wrap up our summer series through the Psalter. We arrive at Psalm 45. Uh, just as a heads up, next week we're going to be beginning our, our, our new series. And it's going to take us uh, into the fall and, and actually into next year. And that will be in uh, the book of Galatians. Paul's letter to Galatia. So this morning, uh, we're going to finish things up in Psalm 45, a psalm filled with mystery and intrigue. It's, it's a psalm um, that reads sort of like something you'd find in C.S. Lewis. It's a, it's a wedding psalm. Psalm 45. To the choir master, according to Lily's, a maskal of the sons of Korah, a love song. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider, and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your Lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber, with robes interwoven with gold. In many robed, many colored robes, she is led to the king, with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. God has spoken these things to you that his joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, come before you in, in many ways disillusioned and disgruntled, um, cynical by a fallen world, by unrequited love, by brokenness and despair, anguish, Lord, we pray that you would revive us. We pray, Lord, that we would gaze upon the beauty of that great wedding. The bride coming for her bridegroom. The bridegroom coming for his bride. And may we be amazed. May we be shocked. May we, may we be re-enchanted by the goodness and the glory of everlasting love. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask you what was the most famous wedding in the last 50 years, a wedding that shook the world, I'm sure most of us would say, well, the wedding of Prince Charles and Diana Spencer, of course. In the summer of 1981, the whole world was caught up in wedding euphoria. 750 million people from 74 countries tuned in to watch what was widely dubbed the real life fairy tale wedding. Some of you might remember that day. I do not. 32 year old Prince Charles of Wales, the next in line to the throne of England, was to marry 20 year old Diana Spencer. Now, it was called a fairy tale wedding for a very good reason. I mean, it just seemed like something out of Hans Christian Andersen. It bore all the pomp and the splendor of a truly royal wedding. It was magical. I mean, here you have this young, eager, innocent woman entering into this high-profile marriage. And the wedding spared no expense. It's estimated that the cost of the wedding was about $100 million. Diana's wedding gown alone was half a million dollars in today's money. It had 10,000 pearls stitched into it. It had a 25-foot train. What could be better? Here you have a real-life Cinderella eager to marry her handsome prince. All of her dreams are coming true. She's becoming a princess, entering into a lifetime of luxury and love. She'll be waited on by servants. All of her needs, her every desire will be met. And this captured the imagination of the whole world. The whole world was enchanted by this. Now, as we know, it didn't take long for the enchantment of the fairy tale to wear off. What began as this archetypal picture of love and happiness devolved into sadness, loneliness, public scandal, and divorce in the years that followed, leaving a world once enchanted by marriage bliss suddenly disenchanted and disappointed. Well, I guess there is no such thing as a fairy tale wedding. Figures. There's no such thing as happily ever after. Such things are best left to naive children's books. The world is too dark, it's too grim to accommodate such a fantasy. Brothers and sisters, Psalm 45 aims to re-enchant the disenchanted. To a world disillusioned and disheartened by unrequited love and cynicism, dreams shattered, hopes unfulfilled, a world of loneliness and betrayal and divorce, a fallen world that has, for good reason, lost hope that true everlasting love is possible, that happily ever after is possible. To this disillusioned, cynical world, we are presented in this psalm with the wedding of all weddings. The true, real life fairy tale wedding. The archetypal wedding that all creation desperately wants and needs. The union of the king of creation and his princess bride, the church. The psalm is a song of celebration on the king's wedding day. And almost like a wedding photographer that that wanders around taking pictures of the groom in his chamber, the, the bride in her chamber getting ready for the wedding, and then the procession, and then the ceremony, and then the family photos. Well, this psalm kind of follows the same track It begins with the majesty and the glory of the king bridegroom, his righteousness, his goodness, his authority. Then it moves to the remarkable beauty of the bride, 
And then we see a, a wedding procession as the eager bride comes forth and she is led to her bridegroom. Sometimes we hear about a match made in heaven. You've probably heard that before. It describes two lovers that, that were just made for each other. Well, this is the actual match made in heaven. This is the wedding that all creation was created for, longs for, searches for. It's the wedding that the cosmos itself, all things, was designed for. The wedding of true Everlasting love. Charles Spurgeon describes Psalm 45 as a celestial canticle of everlasting love fit for the tongues and ears of angels. And my prayer this morning is that we'll see that. My prayer is that we'll be re-enchanted, that we'll be revivified by the everlasting love of Jesus Christ for his church. But not just that, I pray that we'll take our place, not as spectators, guests at this wedding, but as the, the beautiful bride that we were made to be. Three points this morning. First, of, first is the, the majesty of the king bridegroom. Second point is the beauty of the princess bride. And the third point is the legacy of of matrimonial love. The majesty of the king, bridegroom, the beauty of the princess, bride, and the legacy of matrimonial love. So first of all, verses 1 through 9, the majesty of the king, bridegroom. Now we have to remember that marriage began in a very lovely, very honorable, very dignified place in Genesis chapter 2. If there was any marriage that two human beings could enter into that reflected the fullness, the beauty, the wonder of marital love. It was the love between Adam and Eve in the garden. A love that Adam put to words in the first love song ever uttered. This at last is bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. And yet as we know, once sin entered the world, things changed. We see that throughout the book of Genesis, throughout the Old Testament, self-love, self-promotion, uh, distrust, betrayal, violence, abuse, neglect, these things began to infect this wondrous God-given institution like a virus. And today, things haven't really changed. Though marriage has been vital to the building and the stabilizing of civilizations all over the world, to, to bringing forth and raising children, to providing the, the context wherein two people love each other and live together and grow old together, challenging and painful though it may be, for many, marriage is no longer worth the effort. Marriage is too painful to bear. At this point in our country, marriage has really taken it on the chin. It's in, it's in a free fall, plunging to historic low levels. According to recent polls, the rate of marriages taking place is now at the lowest it's ever been, at least since they started keeping these records. Seventy years ago, 80% of U.S. households had married couples. This has now fallen to 49%. Now, there's many reasons for this, uh, but one of them, and this is a phrase I, I came across in a, in a secular article, public disenchantment with marriage. Clarissa Sawyer, lecturer in natural and applied sciences at Bentley University, she says that for millennials, getting married is often perceived as a risk. It's a financial risk, it's a relational risk, they fear divorce, and for good reason, 50% of marriages end in divorce. It's also a personal risk. Why would I uh, put myself out there, putting someone else's needs above my own, sacrificing my own desires, 
my goals for someone else when I'm just going to end up hurt? Where's the payoff? Seems like such a needless fuss. Marriage has fallen on hard times today. It's, it's widely perceived as archaic, unnatural, risky at best, and at worst, evil and destructive. A couple of years ago, my family and I, we were back in Pennsylvania visiting the in-laws. And I wandered into Jana's old bedroom, opened the closet, and there hanging in her old closet was her old wedding dress. Forgotten about it. And I told her, hey, you should keep this. We should take this home to Las Cruces. And Jana was hesitant. Don't worry, I asked permission to tell this story. She said, it's just an old dress. What am I going to do with it? it it's all, it's all, uh, it's, it's old. I'm, I'm not going to wear it again. And I said, well, it's your wedding dress. You own it. You should keep it. So she reluctantly agreed. She was pretty indifferent. So I folded it up. I put it in the van, and we took it back to Las Cruces. Now, by this point, the dress is all wrinkly. It's dirty. So I brought it in the house. I hung it up in the closet, and sure enough, there it has remained ever since. I think that dress is what marriage is for a lot of people. Just all wrinkled and dirty and useless. It's a symbol. It's a relic. It's, it's an artifact of a bygone era. Nothing more. Best to be hung up on a hanger, shoved in the back of the closet, and forgotten about. Now let's put a spiritual spin on this. When it comes to our relationship with Jesus, I think many of us are disillusioned. We know the Bible says that Jesus is the great bridegroom, the great lover of our souls. We know that we are his bride, bound with him in holy matrimony. But for many of us, uh, this marriage is really nothing more than ink on a page. I mean, it seems nice on paper, but beyond that, experientially, is there really anything there? Is there anything beyond just the legality of it? Is there actual matrimonial love? Is there real, lasting, mutual affection? How could there be? I mean... Jesus knows who we are. He knows what a lousy, unfaithful spouse we are. He knows about our penchant for infidelity. Years ago, Derek Webb wrote a song about this. It's a song of hesitation. The, the bride of Christ on her wedding day experiencing cold feet. The bride says, could you love me as a wife? Could you love this wayward child, though I don't trust you to provide? With one hand in a pot of gold and with the other in your side? Because I'm so easily satisfied by the call of lovers so less wild that I would take a little cash over your very flesh and blood. In other words, God, are you serious? How could a marriage like this actually work? It defies imagination. It's, it's too good to be true. It's probably just like every other marriage. It's like the Charles and Diana marriage. It's, it's a good concept. It starts off on a good, seemingly good foot, but it just ends in pain. Figures. Brothers and sisters, Psalm 45 answers that disillusionment. It remedies our marriage cynicism by declaring that this is a real marriage. It's not too good to be true. Jesus' love for us is real. It's full. It's everlasting. It comes from a heart bursting with 
glad affection and warmth. Notice this is what our psalmist is most anxious to speak of in the beginning. He's chomping at the bit. He says, my heart overflows. That's the, the verb rahash. It is, is stewing. It is boiling outward with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. And in verse 2, we see why he speaks of the most handsome of the sons of men. A man who is wondrous to behold, beautiful in appearance. He's the Prince Charming of Prince Charmings. Song of Solomon, chapter 5, says that he is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among ten thousand. But notice, he's not just beautiful. According to the psalm, he's great. He's great. He goes on to speak of his military prowess in verse 3. His skill in the art of war in verse 5. He's a man of strength and dexterity. He's a man who exudes greatness and power. Verse 8 says that his robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia, which were sacred and costly spices back in the day. So this king slash husband isn't just great at war, but but even his robes adorn his greatness. This king has a superabundance of greatness. He's just radiating prominence and majesty and splendor from his pores. But his greatness doesn't even stop there, not even close. He's also great because he's God. In verses 6 and 7, verses quoted in Hebrews chapter 1, he talks about how this king is a God king. He's divine. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, he says. And it's more than that. This king who is God has a God himself too. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. In other words, this God king was appointed by God to rule. So he's beautiful, he's great, he's also really, really good. Verse 4 says that he rides out for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Verse 6 describes his scepter as a scepter of uprightness, how he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. So as the psalmist puts this composite picture together for us, we begin to see who this man is and why the psalmist is so excited to fawn all over him. He speaks of a king-slash-god-slash-bridegroom who is altogether fair, who radiates perfection, who glows goodness and, and greatness and beauty. We sang of him earlier, fair are the meadows, fairer still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fair. Jesus is pure. Fair is the sunshine, fairer still the moonlight and all the twinkling starry host. Jesus shines brighter. Jesus shines pure. Friends, how amazing it is in our disenchanted, disgruntled world, a world that views marriage with such suspicion and disregard. How amazing it is that the Lord of all creation is a husband. And not just any husband, but the most radiant and desirable husband imaginable. Now the psalmist isn't done. He goes on to talk about the bride. A bride who's not just beautiful, but emanates such such a fullness of beauty that even her all-beautiful, fairest of all husbands desires it. That's the second thing for us to think about here, the beauty of the princess bride. 
For the rest of our psalm, beginning in verse 10, the psalmist focuses on the bride. First of all, she is the envy of the nations, the psalmist says. Even the wealthiest nations will adore her. Verse 12, the people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. Now, we shouldn't gloss over that reference. Remember, the people of uh, Tyre were powerful and wealthy. Tyre was a very powerful city in Phoenicia. The people of Tyre were world-renowned as traders and navigators, little-known factoid, uh, one of their goods was a purple dye that they, that they developed and traded. They, they manufactured it from a very special seashell that, that uh, grew offshore. And this, and this purple dye became the envy of the world, even kings and queens. Uh, in fact, it was the people of Tyre that made purple the color of royalty, as it still is today. So this was an exceedingly wealthy, world-renowned city. The people of Tyre were the fashion designers of kings and queens. These people, according to the psalmist, seek the bride's favor. They, the envy of the world, envy her. But not just the nations, her soon-to-be husband, king, too. And why? Why do the nations desire her? Why does the king desire her? Because she is glorious in beauty. She has a beauty that is immeasurable and unmatched. Back to Song of Solomon, which should really be read in tandem with Psalm 45. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, says, and this is the bridegroom speaking to his bride, you are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Now back to the question from point one. How can that be? Why would the spotless, shining king of perfection, the one who holds a scepter of uprightness, desire our beauty? I mean, has he ever met us? Does he know us at all? I mean, we're not exactly Proverbs 31 material. Why would the fairest Lord Jesus desire our beauty? Well, Martin Luther helps us out. He says, When you have heard, seen, and forgotten all your own righteousness, and believed, then you are fair. Not in your own beauty, but in the beauty of the King who adorned you. See what he's saying? The beauty which has caught the eye of the beholder, our bridegroom, is not any inherent beauty, nor is it a beauty that we achieve by making ourselves beautiful. No, it's a beauty that we receive from the bridegroom himself. Our first bridegroom makes us fair by clothing us in his fairness, his beauty, his elegance. He surrounds us like with a the giant cloak, a cloak of his own brilliance, his own grandeur, his own righteousness. This is something we'll hear a lot about in our new sermon series that begins next week. The book of Galatians is all about how not our righteousness, but the bridegroom's righteousness is what makes us right with God. How the spotless, wrinkle-free wedding dress that we don is his own. It's about how God makes us beautiful in Christ, how God has overcome the obstacle of our inherent unloveliness, the ugliness of our sin and shame by nailing it to his cross, burying it in his tomb, and arising victorious, thereby giving us what we could never hope to achieve 
on our own. The beauty of holiness. So that we could receive those words that we heard from Song of Solomon. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw. No flaw in you. So that we could have that real life fairy tale wedding that we always wanted but could never have because of our sin. You know, one of the greatest realizations you and I can ever have is that life is not about achieving beauty, but receiving beauty. Life is not about the quest for nirvana, or moksha, as our Buddhist and Hindu friends would say. It's not about making oneself beautiful or lovable. Rather, our great mission is to forget about our own beauty, as Luther said, and instead behold the beauty and the loveliness of Christ with unveiled face, and in doing so, be transformed into that same beauty from one degree of glory to another, as Paul says. That's the great good. That's the chief end of life under the sun. Behold the beauty of Christ. And boy, is that something we need to be reminded of all the time, isn't it? It's so easy to forget. It's so easy to overlook in a world where everyone and everything is, you know how it is, graded on a scale, where you and I are constantly measured. We measure each other. We measure ourselves by acquired beauty, whether it's physical beauty or ideological beauty or the beauty of success or fame. Look this way, think this way, then you are beautiful. That's a lie. That's why we need the gospel. The gospel reprograms us. The gospel reorients us and wakes us up to the truth. The gospel comes to us and says what we see here in verse 10. Forget your people and your father's house. In other words, leave and cleave. Forget the lie. Go to he who is beautiful. Gaze upon him and be made beautiful in him. Now as we go on to see in the last couple verses, this wedding has an enormous impact. Not just on the happy couple, but on everything. This wedding between the bridegroom king and his princess bride has national, international, even cosmic consequences. It shakes creation to its core. It's our last point here. The legacy of matrimonial love. Verse 16 In place of your fathers shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. You know, as we find ourselves thinking about our legacies, what we leave behind for our children, I think about it a lot. The impact we make in this short life, how we'll be remembered. We have to bear in mind that according to Scripture, the truest and noblest and most long-lasting legacy that we will ever leave, brothers and sisters, is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Growing up, I remember my parents listening to a lot of Steve Green. And one song that was tattooed on my brain since I was a little kid was a song called Find Us Faithful. It goes, we're pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road, and those who've gone before us line the way, cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary, their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace. And the chorus goes like this. Oh, may all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way 
May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe. Friends, faithfulness to Christ, running the race that is before us, making Christ known to our children and to the nations is the most important legacy that we will ever leave. It eclipses everything else. Every other priority. It's more important than leaving that nest egg, than than achieving that promotion, getting that dream house, going to that dream college, hitting everything on that bucket list. The sad reality is you can have ten generations of faithfulness, but it only takes one to break the chain. We're only one generation away from apostasy. I've known so many Christians that have broken that chain. Good friends of mine. Heroes of mine. Don't let that be you. Be faithful. Be the bride that makes the beauty of your bridegroom known in all generations. When you leave this world, may it be said of you, they were faithful. May the fire of your devotion light their way. Brothers and sisters, this is a marriage worth sacrificing for. It's worth everything. After all, this marriage that is a marriage that begins and ends in joy. It's the marriage that all creation wanted. It's the marriage that all creation needed but could never have. It's the marriage wherein all creation is made whole again. It's amazing how the Bible not only begins with marriage, but it ends with marriage. Ever notice that? Creation itself, all time and space, is literally bookended with marriage. As we heard in the scripture reading, one day the bride, the wife of the Lamb will appear. The holy city Jerusalem will come down out of heaven arrayed like a bride on her wedding day. Her radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. In other words, one day the sands of time will sink and all creation will go down that aisle. All creation will march that wedding procession, perfected, pristine, adorned in the glory of her bridegroom, the white wedding gowns of his righteousness. All creation will walk that aisle, gazing upon the face of her Redeemer, waiting for her. Talk about a real life fairy tale wedding. And one day, all creation with the redeemed of God leading the way will walk that aisle singing one cosmic chorus in something like the words that we're about to sing. The bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will gaze not at glory but on my King of grace. Not at the crown He gifteth, but on His pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land. Amen. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we wait for that day. We pray, O Lord, that we would keep our gaze upon the beauty of the Bridegroom on He who makes us beautiful, who makes us worthy, who makes us righteous and lovely to You. O Father, we pray, come Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, we wait anxiously for that day yet to come. And meanwhile, Lord, we pray that we would keep oil in our lamps. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful, that we would make 
the name of our bridegroom known in all generations, among all nations. All for the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.